Turn in our Bibles to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 11, Romans 11, praise God. I didn't even tell a joke. Hallelujah. Romans 11, um, you know, my dad uh, was, he majored in, in horticulture. Uh, and uh, you know he was a he was a farmer, uh, and growing up, uh, we learned to take care of orchards, apple orchards. And in my dad's orchard, uh, well, we planted a new orchard when I was a kid. I remember helping plant that orchard, hundreds of of uh, little apple trees. Amen. Just like, kind of like the size of the trees that I planted out here. But in the middle of that orchard was an old tree. Uh, that was there already and that tree was was very interesting because that tree produced red delicious apples and the golden delicious apples in the same tree and so it's like wait a minute how how is that possible and so one of the things that my dad learned uh in in, in horticulture in in school he went to the school in las cruces uh, uh mexico state university and uh and so one of the things he learned to do was how to graft uh, one tree to another. Um, in fact, any, any fruit tree that you buy is a grafted tree. It, it, it's grown from a stock and then, it's, then they, they graft in uh, the kind of fruit tree that they want and then that, that'll take off. It's a little bud. Have you ever noticed in the spring you see little buds? forming on the on the trees well what they do is they take a bud from a tree that they know is a certain kind and they they manipulate it and they they cut a little slit in the tree that they want to graft it into they slip it in put the skin back or the bark and and then wrap it around and if it's successful it'll grow and that branch will produce that kind of fruit so that's how that worked that's why my dad had a tree that made both red delicious and golden delicious in the same tree. Amen. Now you might be thinking, Pastor, why are you telling us about apple trees? <laughs> that doesn't sound like a, a, a topic for a sermon. Well, uh, it actually is because the Bible tells us that we, as, as Gentiles who are not born Jews, which are the chosen people of God, we have been grafted into God's tree. And it's not a fruit tree, it's an olive tree, amen. Uh, I guess olives are a type of fruit, but uh, I want to, to speak to you just a, for a few minutes about the privilege of salvation. And, and because God did what, did what he did, you and I are able to be saved, amen. And so, so uh, let's uh, look at the text in Romans chapter 11, verse 22. <coughs> We're going to read uh, down to verse 2 of chapter 12, okay? So it says this. It says, Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell. Severity, on those who fell, severity, but toward you, goodness. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise you will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. So, so what he's talking about here is the nation of Israel. Okay? And the nations of the Gentiles. The ones who were cut off were the nation of Israel. Uh, they were scattered after, after uh, the time of Christ. Um, mainly because they rejected Christ and they didn't believe in him. And so, so uh, the, that gave us Gentiles an opportunity to be saved. It says, 
Verse 23, and they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. So he's talking about the Jewish nation. For if you were cut off out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Um, you know, I was uh, talking with someone this week, and we're talking about that scripture, and, and there's a day, there's coming a day when the very last Gentile will be saved, that the fullness of the Gentiles will come in. And I believe when that happens, the rapture of the church is also going to happen. And then God is going to, to turn back to Israel. Verse 26, it says, And so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, The deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But concerning the, the election, they are beloved for the sake of the Lord. For the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. For as you were once disobedient to God, yet now have obtained mercy through their disobedience. Even so, these also have now... <coughs> pardon me. These also... Uh, have now been disobedient that through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. For God has committed them to all disobedience that he might have mercy on all. And then he says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become his counselor? Or who has first given to him, and it shall be repaid to him. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen. So, as we read these scriptures, what, I, what we need to understand is God's intention for the nation of Israel and for the church of Jesus Christ. These are two separate entities. The church has not replaced the nation of Israel in God's heart. The nation of Israel are still the chosen people, but they, as the scripture says in, in verse 25, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so God is going to save Israel. That's what it says. And so all Israel will be saved as it is written. So this is a prophetic word. Uh, this is speaking of the things that are happening in the last days. Um, and... Uh, the last days have been going on for a couple thousand years now, and uh, but I think I really believe that we are getting very, very close to the coming of Jesus. Amen. And so, so Israel has been traditionally closed uh, to the gospel. Amen. Uh, you know, uh, the the nation was rebirthed in uh, uh, 1984. Oh, I'm sorry, 1948 at the close of of World War II. And so, you know, the fact that this nation has risen out of the ashes of history and become a nation again is unprecedented. That's never happened uh, in, in the history of the world. But it was a fulfillment of God's prophecy that he would bring his people back into Israel again. Amen. And make them a nation again. And so that has happened. Um, I remember speaking with Pastor Mitchell, uh, Pastor Wayman Mitchell. Uh, many years ago about Israel and he said Israel is not open to the gospel they wouldn't send a fellowship church into Israel because because they were hostile to Christians 
And so in recent years, though, that our, the, our fellowship has planted two churches in Israel. Uh, they are, uh, they are uh, uh, Jewish uh, pastors, you know, men who got saved in the church, are born-again Christians, but they have a Jewish heritage so they can go back. And uh, just recently I was sharing with some folks how, how uh, uh, I was, you know, looking at some uh, video on YouTube. And you know how they do the advertisements before you actually see the video. And a couple, three different times I've seen this, this guy uh, talking. And he says that Israel traditionally has not been open to the gospel. But in recent years, if you do, uh, if you, uh, do some research, you'll find out that the number one search in Google in Israel is Jesus, which is pretty astonishing. Amen. And so there's a turning that is taking place. Uh, and so Israel will be restored. Amen. In our text, uh, the, the, the Apostle Paul writes in verse 22, he says, Therefore consider the goodness and severity of God. Amen. The goodness and severity of God. And he, what he says is on those who fell, referring to the Jewish nation because they rejected the Christ, he says, on those who fell, severity. And what he goes on to say is God cut them off. They were scattered all over the world in every nation and didn't come back together until uh, 1948. And he says, uh, severity on them, but then he says, but toward you, goodness. God has shown goodness to us and made it possible for us to come into his kingdom. Amen. That we who were not a people can now be called the people of God. Amen. That's what I mean when I say the privilege of salvation. And, and Paul uses the, the word picture uh, in verse 24. He says, if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more? Uh, will these who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive trees? So, so that's the that's the the picture of the grafting that is taking place. So, when a, a little shoot or a little uh, a bud is grafted in, it receives the life of the true branch or the true tree, and it can grow and flourish. So, when we got saved, we we're grafted into the the. Uh, the cultivated olive tree, which is the family and the household of God and the life of God has come into us and caused us to flourish. Amen. Jesus kind of uh, touched on that in John 15. He said, I am the vine and you are the branches. And the idea there is that there's a vital connection between us and God through Jesus Christ. Amen. And so, praise God, this is the, the idea because of God's kindness toward us, we are able to enjoy the blessings of Abraham. Amen. The blessings of Abraham. Uh, Abraham was the father of the Jewish nation. And when God called Abraham out of, out of uh, uh, the Ur of the Chaldees, and, and then they, had, they moved from there to Haran, uh, it says that, that, uh, that uh, God came to Abram and he, he called him and he said, get out of your country. In Genesis 12, out of, uh, from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so the Bible says, so Abraham obeyed God. He believed God. He followed uh, uh, God and it was his faith that, that uh, uh, made him righteous in the eyes of God. And so those who believe in Christ, like you and I, we're blessed because we put our trust in Jesus. Amen. Because our obedience and our lives have been uh, given over to follow Jesus Christ. And so we are privileged to be a part of the family of God. We didn't have a place, but God made a place for us through the blood of Jesus. Amen through the sacrifice of the Son of God. And we've been grafted in to the cultivated olive tree, which is God's house, God's kingdom, God's family. Amen. So all the blessings that flowed from God to Abraham are now able to flow to us. Amen. 
the blessings of uh, that that uh, overtake us that are written of in Deuteronomy 28 uh, when he said if you obey the, the word of the Lord if you obey the commandments of God he says these blessings will will overtake you amen and come upon you because of your faithfulness amen and so the thing I want us to remember tonight every one of us needs to remember is that salvation is a gift amen. it's a gift we don't deserve to be saved. Amen. Amen. You know, a lot of people complain and cry about, well, it's not fair. Well, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, God doesn't give us what we deserve. And uh, thank God. <laughs> Amen. He gives us what we don't deserve. Amen. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. Amen. In other words, we cannot take credit for our salvation. Salvation was something done for us, given to us. Amen. And if God hadn't been merciful to us, we would not be saved. Amen. I want you to listen to this verse from Titus chapter 3, verse 1 through, uh, 1 through 8. It says, Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, but to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. <coughs> Listen to this. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, and hating one another. Anybody relate to any of those? And it says, but when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. Amen. We are not saved because of our own goodness. We're not saved because, uh, because we did something to deserve salvation. As a matter of fact, most of our lives we lived as enemies of God. Amen. That description that Paul gave uh, in verse 3, he said, We ourselves were also once foolish. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you ever made foolish decisions in your life. Uh, disobedient. Deceived. I mean, these are like, geez, why don't you just hit the nail on the head, Holy Spirit? Because, yep, that describes uh, you and I serving various lusts and pleasures. Oh, yeah, we did that. Amen. Living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. We, you know, all those things were part of our lives. But he didn't save us because we were good. He saved us because he loves us. Amen. That, is the, that is the privilege of salvation. Amen. God opened the door for us. So that we could be saved. Amen. Amen. Let, me, let me talk to you finally about the responsibility of salvation. Because as we read this, this text in Romans 11. I just read this recently. Uh, and it made me ponder on it again. And so it tells us that we were grafted in as Gentiles. Now remember this is the book of Romans. So Paul was writing to a Gentile church. He was writing to the Romans, the, the Christians who had become Christians in Rome. So Rome was the seat of, of Caesar's power, and, and uh, this was a very uh, pagan culture. Okay? They didn't worship God. And so, you know, what we, the way we live is very much like the, the way the Romans live. You know, the, there was very much immorality. There was very much, uh, you know, child uh, exploitation lot of, of bad stuff was going on uh, in that place and so 
So uh, to be saved out of a wicked world is a great privilege. And so he's talking about how we were grafted in. And then he says, I beseech you, therefore, verse 1 of chapter 12. The thing to understand about the Bible is when it, it was written, it, was, it wasn't divided. It, wasn't, it didn't have the divisions that we see. From chapter 11 to chapter 12, it was one thought that was flowing. Okay? And so it was the interpre interpreters who, who made these divisions. But as he has said, you were, you were grafted in. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, uh, you know, because you were so good. It was really because of the disobedience of the Jews that we had the opportunity to be saved. So then he says, therefore, I, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so because of the great privilege God has given us to be saved, we also have we have responsibility. How I many know with privilege comes responsibility? Amen. And so it, the responsibility that we have as children of the King who had mercy on us, who forgave our sins, who brought us out of darkness and into the glorious light of the kingdom of His, His Son, our first responsibility, according to Paul, is to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Your, how many know we serve God with our body? We don't serve God with the flesh. We, our service to God is spiritual, but we do serve God with our body. Amen. That's why we're here physically. Amen. We, we didn't, uh, you know, send our spirit to church. <laughs> Amen. We physically got ready. We physically came and we physically are serving God. Amen. So, what this means is to make yourself, your person, your body, your time, your energy available for God's service. To do God's work. Amen. And so God wants us to love him with all our hearts, all mind and strength. But he also wants us to love him with our body. Serve him with our body. That's why we have to take care of our body. Amen. That's why we have to not abuse ourselves uh, with the... Uh, with uh, the things of this world so that we can be healthy, so we can be strong, so that we're not, you know, uh, we're not, uh, uh, you know, uh, limiting our ability to do something for God. Amen. Uh, one of the things that we're, we're very notorious for in our nation is, is overeating. You know, I read this thing the other day and it says, do all that you do for the glory of God. Then it asked this question that I didn't appreciate. It says, can you overeat to the glory of God? like, hmm, good question. <laughs> In the United States of America, we tend to overeat. Amen. I remember one evangelist saying, Americans are killing themselves with a knife and a fork. You know, and uh, it was, uh, he was from Canada, so he could say that. And uh, praise God. But here's the thing. God wants us to serve him with our body to, to be able to, to do his work. Amen. Uh, building his church is built, or the church is built by the efforts of God's people, amen, uh, in our witness, in our testimony, in our preaching, in our serving of others, amen. The way we serve God is by serving others. The church is, is the body of Christ, amen. And so, you know, when people say, well, I don't need to be a part of the church to serve God, well, they're, you know, then how do you serve God if you're not serving God? others or serving with others. What ends up happening is, is we just do our own thing, you know, end up serving ourselves. And so our first responsibility is to pre present ourselves to God to do His work. Amen. When you think about what the those early apostles did and the disciples, they served. Amen. They were, you know, they weren't just there for glory and getting the limelight. Initially, they kind of had that attitude when they when Jesus was there. You'd always see him arguing about which one of them was going to be the greatest. You know, I was reading uh, Luke the other day, and, and they're at the Last Supper, and Jesus is is telling them one of you is going to betray me. And they were all, ah, you know, who could it be? 
And the very next verse, they're arguing about which one of them is going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. And I'm like, eh. You know, sometimes people still today, we get ambitious. Amen. And we want glory. And uh, that, that's, not, that's not the right spirit. We're to serve God for His glory. Amen. And so we give our bodies in exchange for what He's done for us. You know, I mean, we all do this. You know, if, if you work a job, you present your body at an employment place in exchange for money. Even if you work from home, you're still working. You're still taking your time, your person, and you're, you're uh, working to, to uh, uh, you know, to produce something for someone else. And how many know salvation is greater than money? Amen. The work of God is greater than, than, than uh, obtaining money in this life. I'm not saying don't work and don't obtain money because we need you to work and obtain money so you can give and support the work of God. Amen. Years ago, I remember uh, Pastor Greg Mitchell saying that, that the church uh, is, not, is not going to uh, reach the world on minimum wage. Amen. So if you, if you get a good job, praise the Lord. Amen. Do good. If you have a business, you start a business, uh, we'll pray for the success of your business. But use what God gives you for His glory. Amen. For the furthering of His kingdom. Glory to God. Okay, so we need to present our bodies. The second uh, responsibility of, of this great salvation that we have is to resist conforming to the world. Amen. Resist becoming like the world. Verse 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Amen. And that, what, what is that? It, basically, it's telling us to become more like Jesus and less like the world. Amen. We don't, we don't have any problem being worldly, do we? I mean, worldly is our default mode. That's, that's what we, that's what we go back to by default, if, if we don't serve God, we're going to become worldly. And basically what this means is not to copy the behavior and the customs of the world in which we live. Amen. When you read the Bible, and, and God brought Israel out of, out of the, uh, the bondage of Egypt and into the land of Canaan, the promised land, he warned them, he said, don't become like the people who live there now. The people who live there now are idolaters. They worship false god gods. They sacrifice their children in the fire to their to their false gods. They live highly immoral lives. God gave a lot of moral laws to His people: how they should live, how they should honor their bodies, how they should be faithful to their to their spouse, how they should treat one another, not stealing from one another, not not falsely accusing one another, not not you know. Uh, being, uh, you know, vicious to each other. And so he says, don't be like the people of the world. Amen. You know, women, uh, you know, don't be like those women on the novelas, you know. They, they're, they're, they're always jealous and they're always, you know, uh, uh, looking to put over, put something over on someone else. And, you know, uh, be, be careful. Read the Word of God. Amen. If you read the Word of God and you read it with a heart to know what God says, God will show you how He wants you to live. Amen. And so, it has to do with who you hang out with. Amen. If you hang out with ungodly people, you're going to be an ungodly person. If you spend your time with ungodly people, that's what you'll become. Amen. And so, as Christians, we, you know, we're not called to leave the world and completely separate ourselves from the world. We're called to reach the world for Jesus. Amen. Amen. And that, that we, instead of being influenced, we're influencers. Amen. And that the gospel will, will shine through us. And so uh, we're not only not to be polluted by the sins of this world, but we're to be distinct from the people of the world. Amen. That others may see that there is a difference in you. That's why Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Let your light so shine that may, men may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. In other words, 
be a Christian and others will see that and they will glorify God because it was God that did that. Especially people who knew you. Amen. Amen. When they see your, your changed life, they're like, what happened to you? What a perfect opportunity to share with them the goodness of God. Yes. Amen. The privilege of salvation. Amen. And so uh, what that means is we have to let God transform us. Amen. Amen. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be renewed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, God wants you to change the way we think. Amen. What changes the way we think is the Word of God. It's the Holy Spirit. It's the example of our brothers and sisters who have gone before us in the Lord. Amen. We follow the example of those who are who are ahead of us in Christ. Amen. That's what that's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. We are following somebody. Amen. If you're if you're not following a, a leader, uh, you're you're not becoming a disciple. Amen. Becoming a disciple means that you are are uh, uh, doing what those who are uh, in in uh, authority over you are doing. Paul said this: "Follow me, just as I follow Christ." In First Corinthians eleven one, Amen. And so that our lives are transformed by the example of others. You know, when you get saved, you don't know how to serve God. I know I didn't. I didn't have a clue. When I was still in the world before I came into the church, I did not know what to do. God showed me a couple things, like don't go, not, not to go to bars. You know, I learned that, uh, and and that was you know just God showing me to do that and uh, to to let go of the drinking. But my life literally began to be transformed as I came into the fellowship of the saints, right. Amen, and saw how Christians live how Christians are supposed to live. And so what happens is, is our thinking begins to be conformed to his thinking. The values of the Christian church become our values. And it changes us. To conform means to become like or to make similar, to be in agreement, obedient or submissive to. And so that means that we have to allow God to change our mind, to change our behaviors, to change the way that we think and act, and that that takes time. You know, when somebody comes into the church, we don't go and inspect their life and tell them, okay, you gotta do this and this and this and this. You know, people have a, a grace period where, where we wanna, if they have the goods, God's gonna show them what they need to do. Amen, Amen. they don't need us to police their life. Amen. Amen. And so, you know, when it comes to ministry, that's a little different because there are requirements, there's standards uh, for public ministry. And so, but until that is, you know, uh, I, I've told people in the past, you do not have to be in ministry. But if you want to be in ministry, this is what it takes. My pastor uh, told us all one day, we were at a, a, a ministry meeting and he, he gave us, went through the lines of what it requires to be in ministry. And he said, you know, you don't, you don't have to do this unless you want to be in ministry. If you want to be in ministry, then you have to qualify yourself. And so we all agreed. And uh, those who didn't want to, uh, to live to that standard didn't. And uh, nobody judged them for that. They just go to church, serve God, uh, you know, but they're not in public ministry. Amen. So um, as you... As you conform your life to God and His ways, what you will discover and what you'll find is God's will for your life. And that's what the scripture says. Look at what it says. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen. The will of God can be mysterious, but it's revealed in the going. It's revealed in the following. You know, the disciples were in the dark for three years and they were the closest to Jesus and they didn't have a clue what, what God was uh, doing. They didn't get it until after the resurrection, after Jesus had gone back to heaven and after they got filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Then it was like, ding, the light came on and says, oh, we're supposed to go preach the gospel. Amen. We're supposed to live right. We're supposed to help people serve God. And so, as you follow, as you follow in the steps of, of uh, you know, the, the ancients, uh, like Abraham, you'll discover that God has a perfect will for your life. I want to read one more scripture and then we're going to pray. <coughs> Hebrews 11 in the Hall of Fame of Faith speaks of, of uh, Abraham. And it says this in verse 8, 9, and 10. Hebrews 11. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. So that's pretty powerful. You know, uh, some people would call that blind faith. And, you know, I guess you could say that, but it says he obeyed God. And then it says in verse 9, by faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise, for he waited for the city which has foundations whose builder and maker is God. And so as Abraham obeyed God, not really understanding all that God was doing, he walked right into the destiny God had for him, for his descendants, uh, into the blessing God had promised. And I want to tell you something. God has a destiny for every one of us. Amen. Amen. He has something great according to his will. And the way we find that is just by following and listening and conforming our lives to the will of God. And it will be revealed in its own time. Amen. Amen. So don't worry about, God, what do you want me to do? You know, just serve God. Do what you know to do. And God will reveal things to you as you go along. Amen. It's like climbing a hill. You know, you get to the top of the hill and now you can see a little bit further. Things, more things are revealed to you. Amen. And usually uh, in the Christian life, when you climb to the top of one hill, you look and you see further, but you see there's another hill. Amen. Because the Christian life is an upward climb. Amen. It's an upward calling. And uh, we're just going to keep going up and up and up until we get to that place that God has for us. But we have to believe God. We have to trust Him. We have to know that, hey, what a privilege that we can even be saved. We don't deserve to be saved, but God saved us. He grafted us in to, to his olive tree. And, uh, you know, we shouldn't, you know, be lifted up in pride. Hey, you know, God saved me. I must be special. Well, you are special, but don't think too much of yourself. Because as Paul said in our text, he said, he puts you in the tree. He can take you out just as easily. Amen. Amen. And so let's uh, let's be humble. Let's. Let's uh, uh, present our bodies to God. Let's let God change us. Amen. Amen. Okay. So let's pray. Let's ask God's grace, His blessing as we uh, go 